In this uh, second half of the lecture, I'm going to talk about um, some more advanced time series analysis. So this basically assumes that you have your data cleaned up um, with timestamps uh, well noted, so everything is sort of ready for analysis. So we're going to dive into a little bit of time series analysis. So the first um, thing that I'm going to do is actually just walk through a little bit of um, territory that's outside of 601, but basically the, the conclusion for this section is that you can draw a line through a set of points. So if nothing else, linear regression for trend analysis just means that you need to figure out what the slope of a line is through a set of points. Yeah, let's see if we can get a little better visualization of that slide. Yeah. So uh, first, the machine learning topics where linear regression falls into is uh, under uh, this branch here. So machine learning can basically be split into supervised and unsupervised learning. Then we'll say supervised learning um, can be split into regression and classification. And so we're either going to predict real valued output or discrete valued output. And so here I have a set of real values. And so linear regression is basically the idea of I have a plot of say two axes x and y and I want to figure out uh, for any given x value, what is the corresponding y value? So that's linear regression is basically just fitting a line to a set of points. Okay, so if I had a, a class in front of me of live actual students, I would request um, that someone draw a line on this plot um, through a set of points. And so typically what the student will do is given a set of points, they'll try and minimize the distance between that line and any set of points um, that are from that line. So they're minimizing that distance. That's a certain type of regression called Deming regression. So it's a, a very intuitive approach. And that's all that we're really talking about here in some sense, with some slight modifications. Okay, so the what we really care about is not so much the actual sort of distance from the line as it is perpendicular, but more so the uh, distance along the uh, y-axis, because this is like your input you have certainty on, your output you typically don't uh, have certainty on. So like the distance from your point to the line is called the residual, and so in some sense you're just finding the line that has the least distance of all the separation from that line to the points. That's what linear regression is basically trying to, trying to do. So it's a fancy concept in machine learning, but really you're just sort of minimizing distances. The, the challenge is, is that although that idea is pretty straightforward um, and the minimizing the distance part is not very complicated mathematically, there are some sort of exceptions in which case you have to be sort of wary. Um, there, is a, there is an assumption that the variance of any of those um, points doesn't change over your input values. And so it's a heteroscedastic error is basically the amount of error changes as the range of x values does. So if that's the case, um, your the approach which you use to do that best fit might change. Um, and so there's uh, the, also the assumption that every data point is uncorrelated. And so therefore, you maybe um, have to account for that. Um, so basically, the, the way in which you fit the line may have some dependence on the features in your data. Okay, so time for a joke. Basically, like <laughs> the linear fit that we're covering today in this class is sort of like the absolute simplest case. And then there's all these such much more fancy curve fitting techniques, um, and they all have their own problems. So I'm just going to stick with the simple approach today. And uh, other arguments for why a different fit might be better, I'll leave to others. All right, so why do we care? Well, there's sort of two big cases. One is prediction. So like if you're gonna sort of predict what a new value is either outside of your range or within the range of values that you have, that's one type of prediction. And then like fitting trends. And so like what we're gonna focus on for time series data, this is a second use case where I actually wanna just measure what the, the slope is for a given set of data points. But typically in a machine learning class, you'd see more focus on prediction. Um, okay, so back to the idea of like fitting a line. So I used to teach physics classes, 
where I actually had students do this experiment. They were uh, undergraduates, not um, children. Uh, and so they would roll a ball down a ramp and they'd go off of the ramp into a basket. So that was the idea. And I'd have them record a set of 10 data points. And so if you can picture sort of like on your left hand side of the screen here, there's a ramp with a little tail at the end of it that kicks the ball up. And so they would measure a set of data points corresponding to those values. And they'd fit a line. And they said, the ball data points fit this line. And so we can predict what the ball is going to do. So uh, the problem here is that um, if you sort of zoom into the wrong part of the curve, it does in fact look linear, but the ball trajectory is actually parabolic. And so the problem is that the students would sort of fit their data to the, the region of the curve that looks flat, but it wasn't actually. So this is sort of like the, the takeaway message is have some reason for why you expect the behavior of the data. If you're just sort of blindly mapping Oh, the data looks linear, therefore we'll use a linear fit. And maybe it does have this really great fit um, for that set of data. But if you don't understand the underlying physics of what's going on, you're probably going to get something wrong. Okay, so don't trust your data. Ask questions about it. Um, and that's the most common problem that I see of like, oh, we'll just fit this line to this data. Does it make sense to do that? It's like the underlying question. Okay, so. That's all a big setup for the idea of analyzing time series data, because here we're going to use the assumption that I can fit a straight line to a set of time series data, but all of that is caveated by the fact that you should know whether that's reasonable to do or not. So we're going to dive in a little bit into this technical technique, but I'm advocating that you be able to understand the context in which it's being done. So as an example of that, um, here's some uh, time series data of number of uh, passengers this, um, over the years. Right? So this is the, the year from 1949 to 1959, and the number of passengers flying is increasing over time. Okay, so maybe we'd expect that. The industry is sort of growing, right? And then uh, there's some number of observations, and so there's some, some series here of variation that we see. But there's also a trend that sort of sloped upwards. So there's um, the, the, the goal of the time series analysis, in some sense, is to be able to apply your tools to the data to do analysis. But in order to do that, we have to get the data to be well behaved. So we can't throw random time series data into our analysis and hope things work. We have to account for a few different factors. So the first is what we observed in the previous plot, where the average value for that time series is increasing. And this is the most common thing you'll probably see, is that the there is some slope. If you tried to fit this with the line, the line would be sloped upwards, or maybe in other data you'd see this line sloped downwards. But in any sense, the there's variation that is increasing. And that means the, the average value is increasing over time. And therefore, um, other follow-on analysis won't work. You have to first remove, you have to deal with this artifact. The other sort of Slightly less common uh, observations you'll see in time series data is where the variance changes over time or the covariance. So we'll focus primarily on this one because it's the most common. But there's a fancy time series word for this. These three concepts all captured in the word stationary. So if you see the word stationary associated with time series data, it just means that the data is not varying um, with respect to the mean variance or covariance. OK. so. Here we see in our data set that there is a trend upwards. And so if we want to do time series analysis, we have to remove that time series data. So how do we do that? So we have to remove the, the trend. Um, and so the way that, uh, what, there's a couple different ways to do that. And, we'll, and so uh, we previously just talked about the idea of fitting this with a straight line. Sometimes that works, in which case um, you can take this data and remove the, the slope from it. So we'll show how to do that in another notebook. Um, so basically, if you know what the trend is, you can subtract the trend from the data, and then you get back um, time series data that is oscillating, but there's no slope. So that's that's the goal, right? So first, you have um, data that is increasing over time. You figure out what that average slope is, 
you subtract that from the original data and you get back the oscillation. This is handy because now we can do follow-on analysis and ask like, what is the, the periodicity of this data and what is the noise in this data? Right? And so if you can ask first, is there something that's periodic? And you can say, uh, yeah, it looks like on every year there's some periodic behavior. So that looks good. And then if you know what that periodic behavior is, you can subtract that out and then you're left with the, the noise. So this is the variation that happens that is um, separate from the trend and the seasonality. That's the, the standard recipe for time series data. All right, so this is all. So I'm gonna look at some electrical power data um, from Texas in a notebook. If I can get over to it. All right, so this is coming from uh, ERCOT, the Electrical Reliability Council of Texas. And they basically service most electrical di distribution in, in Texas. So we're going to use libraries like pandas and numpy, which we've seen before in glob, which gets a bunch of files together, and a few new ones. So the most importantly, the seasonal decompose function of stats model. All right, so I happen to have cleaned all the data and put it into a pickle. So the first step we're going to do is we're going to read that data into a data frame. Um, and it's pretty large, so it's 114,000 rows and 11 columns. To see what that looks like, uh, the the timestamp here is in the hour end column, and the other uh, columns appear to be regions. So, like we'll say coast, east, west, and then maybe this is probably the the aggregation of all those different regions. So we can see that we have a year, month, day, and then an hour, and so the hour is incrementing. So from one to two to three to four. So these are hourly measurements. Um, for these different regions, and this is the electrical power load in units that are unknown to us. Okay, so as we'd expect, everything is a date, timestamp, and float, um, and then the, in, the index we can sort of ignore. And then there are no NAN entries in this data, so it's it's already been cleaned up for us. So I already have timestamp data, and so I'm going to use a a matplotlib command called plot date, and so I'm going to specify the the timestamp column and one of the regions. And I'll label that um, the year here on the x-axis, and the power used in unknown units on the y-axis. So visually, just this is sort of like first step: pick out what are the patterns here. The pattern is every year, roughly. So this is a a year. There's a spike. And you sort of expect that, right? For electrical power data, you're going to have uh, summertime. Uh, it's going to be more heat. Therefore, you're going to run air conditioning more. And so there's some. There's already a story here that we can sort of pick out and identify. So this is just a visual quick analysis of our time series data. And on a yearly basis, we see there's a pattern. So the the next sort of trick that I'll show you is. If you expect some other patterns, it's good to sort of verify that those exist. So we know that the sampling of the data is hourly, and there's 24 hours in a day. So if we want to look at five days worth of data, we would look at, say, rows 0 to 24 times 5. So this is, we're picking out a certain number of rows here, and we're going to plot those. And so here, uh, so I've got my plot date, and then I'm rotating my x-axis ticks and I'm labeling the time. So I've got this picture and I can sort of see there's like a 24 hour trend here, right? So this is like every night there's less power used and then during the day when people are awake they're using more power and then at night it dips down again. And so you'd expect a 24 hour sort of pattern going on. And that's what we see. There's some periodicity. Now if you sort of zoom out and, and instead of saying five days, you could say 30 days, so 24 times 30 data points, and we just sort of run that same plot, we might sort of identify, oh, maybe there's weekly trends. Like on the weekends, maybe less pe people use less electricity on the weekends compared to during the day. And so again, this is sort of like what we expect. And then later on in this notebook, we'll verify that that is actually the case.
Okay, so there are daily, weekly, and annual patterns. That's sort of the conclusion of the initial visual analysis. So humans are really good at picking out patterns and you know, leverage that. And just to re recap, we expected to sort of see an annual trend in the summer for Texas. And so then if we look at 24 times 365 data points, that is one year. And so we do actually see, uh, say, say the months of July, June and July, and August in here, we're picking up a lot of heat, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of electrical load is the consequence. So we have a story, the data is clean, it makes sense, we're pretty happy. At this point, you could actually stop, but we actually want to do uh, the rest of this notebook is a more rigorous analysis of time series data. So as we've been looking at here, this is for the east region. So there's a handy map of where the different regions are. I'll be continuing to focus on this east region, but there's uh, a bunch of other columns corresponding to these different regions in Texas. So we could plot that if we wanted, but they're all pretty much similar. Okay, now earlier in this lecture, I mentioned lag plots. So lag plots um, show us whether or not this, the, the sequence matters. And in this case, if you look at all the adjacent data points, we get this nice linear trend here um, that's showing that the data is not random, right? It's time order matters. And that's why this is a, a, a linear sort of correlation here between the adjacent points. So that's cool. Um, are there other things that are similar? Of course, right? So autocorrelation plots. So this is a little bit more fancy. All it does is take that same idea of a lag plot. And instead of looking at the correlation between adjacent data points, it looks at all the different um, distances and so the different lags. So we were looking at a lag of one in that previous plot, but you could look at all the different differences between rows, right? So like maybe every other row and every third row and every fourth row and every fifth row and see if there are correlations. And so running that obviously is computationally more expensive. It takes about a minute to run that analysis. And so we get this sort of weird plot. And all that's really saying is here there's there's a strong correlation at a very, um, if, if you look at the difference between very um, adjacent rows, there's a strong correlation. And then there's an anti-correlation. And then there's some correlation again down at about 10,000. Right? So that means that there's a strong correlation here and here and here. Right? And so like that's sort of weird, but let's we'll, we'll get back to why that is. Okay, so we run another sort of same same analysis, um, but a different library called plot A C F. So it's the autocorrelation function. This one comes with an error bar, so it actually shows us like um, how confident we are about that conclusion. Um, so here, there's a strong correlation, and again, a strong correlation here and here. But then, like this is where our envelope of confidence sort of decreases. So as long as we're outside of that envelope, then we're we're strongly confident about the autocorrelation. Okay, what is all this telling us? Let's let's zoom in, right? So I'm gonna zoom in on just the first sort of lag equals to 40,000. So that's like the range of lags here on the x-axis. And so there's, it, it's saying that there's a strong correlation here initially for a very small lag. And then something at around 10,000, there seems to be a pretty strong correlation. Okay, so what does that number mean to us? Well, remember this is hourly data. And if you think about how many hours are in a year, there's 8,760 hours in a year. And so this this peak here occurs at about a lag of 88,760. So that's quite a coincidence, right? It actually is indicating to us that there is an annual um, uh, correlation between the data points. So that's what that's claiming. That's cool. And the second point, that's that's the two year. So every two years, there's a strong correlation. Every three years, there's a strong correlation. So this, all this autocorrelation function is telling us at this sort of plot scale is that there is an annual correlation that's very strong. All right, so now you'll notice that there's some more detail here. What is, what is that about? Let's zoom in even further. So if we say, only look at the first 400 legs. So there's a really strong correlation down here. So every sort of pair of adjacent entries is uh, correlated. 
And then if we look at, um, there's like this, if you look at the peaks here, it sort of peaks around uh, 160 or so, and then like it peaks up again. And so there's a strong correlation here. Uh, that number happens to be uh, related to the fact that there's seven times 24 hours in a week. That's 168 um, sort of periodicity, right? And so what this is showing us is that there is a weekly trend that correlates in the data. And then this is sort of like the adjacency is saying it's time series. So the fact that this peaks around a week means that we have a weekly correlation. The fact that it's correlating at a, uh, a annual time scale means that there's an annual correlation. So this, there is periodicity in the data. So this is a validation of the trends that we observed earlier. All right, so now we've we've established their correlations. What do we do with them? All right, so earlier I mentioned the idea of removing trends, and we talked about fitting a line to a trend in order to remove the average value. Another way to do that is with a rolling average. So I'm gonna look at just the data for 2006. I'm gonna pick on one year. And we're gonna do this concept of a rolling average, which is basically the idea that I'm gonna take not the average of all the values, but an average of a subset of values. So in, in this little example here, I'm taking uh, a temperature and I'm taking the first three values and the average of those first three values is 44. And I'm taking the second set of three values and I'm getting another value, 51, and I'm taking another set of three values and I'm getting the average of those. And so that is the idea of these little different colored windows are different windows of my data. And then from those windows, you get a single value, but this moving window creates a series of values. And the consequence of that is that it smooths the sort of fluctuations that you see here. So what does that look like in practice? Well, I take my, my east data, so my column of data, and then I'm going to apply a window of size five. And for that window, I want to take the mean, and then I want to display the first 15 values that result from that. So you'll notice that the first few entries are NAN. That corresponds to the case where if I try to take a rolling window of something that only has one value up here and a bunch of NANs like above above it, then it's gonna average to NAN. So in here, our little picture, we had empty values, but um, for pandas, it treats them as NANs. So that's because the window was sort of out of the range of the series. So the, the window is set to sort of like the output to the fifth value, the right edge, it's called. And so there's a first four values are NAN because there were nothing to sort of average up there. But if we get the first five values in the sequence and then average those, it averages to 776. So that's, that's the idea there. All right, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna plot two things. I'm gonna take this rolling window, apply it to my hourly data, and then also plot in the background in cyan, sort of a light blue color, um, the original data set. So we're gonna plot the original data set and the rolling window. So, um, all it really did is sort of like focus the the average, right? So remember, this is our electrical power used over time. And so we could sort of just draw a straight line across there, and maybe at like 1300, that would be an average value. But if I want to sort of keep the periodicity, I could use that rolling window and um, maybe just get a little closer to what the average is without losing all the periodicity. So that's a rolling window. Now you'll notice that there's sort of like a subjective choice here of like what the window size is. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time playing around with the consequence of that rolling window. Here I was using a, a weekly window. And so that washes out all of the sort of hourly data that we had. So if I expand the size of my window to be to be 30 days, so that's 30 days times 24 hours, that's the size of my window, I retain pretty much the same shape. Um, so there might be some value there of um, 
I still get a reasonably good indication of what's happening on a monthly basis. But at some point, when I start making my window size too big, so say 60 months, or even larger, like an entire year, um, I'm washing out more of the um, noise, but I'm also losing some of the signal here. So like there's these little gaps that appear. And if I make my window too large, then I lose both the signal and the noise, and the data is meaningless. So like, it never gets to the exact straight line of sort of what the average of the entire data set is. I mean, it just sort of loses some of the continuity. And, and so there's some subjectivity here of like getting the window size right is something of an art to make sure that you don't lose all the important data that you started out with. All right, so now we're gonna, um, we've, we've sort of covered the concept of a rolling window. And now we're going to use that to uh, analyze our time series data. So I'm going to take a look at the, the original sort of, this is the seasonal decompose argument that it came from the stats library. Um, and I'm going to say that this is my original data for a week, or sorry, 10 days, sorry. And so this is the variation of the power. And then I'm going to apply a rolling window. So the rolling window sort of finds the average as it varies um, for that time series data. And you'll notice that there's a gap here at the beginning and a gap here at the end. And that gap is just because there wasn't any data um, on either side of this. So that's sort of expected. There's a trend. So now the, the fun part is if you take this time series data, which was sort of varying in time, and subtract from those values the rolling window, what you get is a periodic um, sort of change. It's called seasonality, but seasonality is sort of a misnomer because seasonal might may think of like autumn and spring and fall, but here we're looking at it on a 10, 10 days of time. And so the, the seasonality here is a 24 hour periodicity. It's a day to night, day to night. And then if you take the original data set and you subtract out this trend, you get the seasonal data. And then if you take those two and subtract them from the original data, you're left with the noise. So this is like how much noise there is um, when, you, when you add up all th these three plots, you'll get this result. So it's decomposition. And then you can play around with the different sort of like time scales. So if I wanted to have a month of data, then I would be able to capture the fact that there are sort of weekly oscillations. And then you can sort of take the, av the rolling average of that. And then there's, you still have the, um, the 24 hour data and you're left with the noise there. So this is the idea of seasonal decomposition for time series data. So we've looked at um, a rolling average and linear regression, and then there are other methods for trend removal, but that's the sort of the, the game being played here. Right. Our last um, time series tool that we'll explore is called the Fourier transform. This is again, looking for that periodicity. How did we get the periodicity out of our time series data? So the, the one caveat to sort of like be aware of is that you can apply the, the, the Fourier series analysis when the timestamp is sort of every hour, every day, every week. There has to be some uniform distribution of timestamps. It can't be sort of ad hoc event observations. Okay. So this is a pretty mathy concept, and so I'm going to try and walk through it in pictures. The, my goal for walking through this notebook is to deliver to you sort of like a conceptual understanding. I'm not expecting uh, sort of deep uh, comprehension and use of this. It's just sort of exposure to the idea. Okay, so this, this little animation here is spectral decomposition. So it's the idea that you can add different signals together to create a new pattern. And then you can ask what 
things that I need to add with what weights to get that original data set. So this is our, our, our signal of interest, right? So some oscillation that changes going up and down. So maybe this is like um, a thing that you care about and you want to know what would I, what sort of sine waves would I need to construct that um, complicated pattern. So it's asking what is the weight of the different periodicities um, and then this sort of 3D animation is showing you these are the different periodicities that exist and these are the different weights that it was used to construct them. So that's the concept of a Fourier transform. How much weight for each periodicity? All right, so let's use our standard libraries of NumPy and pandas and then uh, we'll make some plots. Okay, so I'm gonna make, I'm gonna run a bunch of math here and basically all I'm doing is I'm making this plot. Um, so I have a sine wave with some periodicity. So maybe, let's see, this is one, two, three, four, five cycles, roughly every every unit of time. So let's call this like a minute. So five cycles per, uh, let's actually call it seconds. So five cycles per second. So that'd be um, in Hertz, five Hertz. And indeed, I got it right. So I guess that um, this is a five Hertz signal. And so I'm measuring it 150 times per second. So that's how many points there are there. And then, uh, so I'm gonna run this uh, for two seconds. So this is it's from zero to two. And I now, so my, my line there is to produce a plot of the sine wave. So then I want to figure out what is the Fourier transform of this function. And so like the, the, the core of what I'm trying to show is this, the use of this numpy.fft. So fast Fourier transform is what it stands for. And all it's really picking out is in the second plot, I have some periodicity of this plot. So it's five cycles per second. And if I plot the Fourier transform of this data, what I get back out is this plot. So there's a whole bunch of zeros and one point uh, here. And so if I ask, what is this point at? It's at five Hertz. And so it's telling us the, the cycle frequency of this oscillation is five Hertz. And there are no other components that created this picture. So I don't have to have any other waves present. The weight of the composition of this is just a single uh, sine wave. So that's that's the use of a Fourier transform is it can take periodic data and tell you what the periodicity of those oscillations is. Okay, so now I'm gonna make a slightly more complicated wave function. Let's run this one. Okay, so now I've got two different oscillations happening. So you can see this is a slightly more visually noisy plot, right? So you can sort of pick out, there's a spike and a dip and a spike and a dip and another spike. And so you've got a different oscillation happening there. Again, we're running the uh, simulation for two seconds and we have a signal of five Hertz. And then we're gonna run the FFT and it will pick out the fact that there is an oscillation at five Hertz, which we saw, and 10 Hertz. So where did that 10 Hertz come from? So there's two different oscillations happening there. Okay, so let's make this a little bit more readable. So that's coming from, um, this, this NumPy, so that was our original uh, oscillation and we're adding in this second oscillation um, at a different frequency. All right, so here's our doubling. So we had five Hertz and now we have 10 Hertz. So we have two different oscillations occurring in one plot and our Fourier transform is able to pick that out. And so that's the relative uh, weight there. And then to make this slightly more realistic, what you'd typically run this against is some uh, data which has um, some noise in it. So this is our same five and 10 Hertz 
oscillations, but with some noise now. So I've added in, let's see, where does the noise happen? So the noise signal here is this third term in our equation. So we have the noise is uh, a random sample from zero to a thousand and then modulated. Uh, and so it's, it's skewing this a little bit, um, but we can still sort of see that there's that the Fourier transform has no problem picking up the fact that there are oscillations at 5 and 10 hertz. And if we throw in even more noise, so at some point it becomes sort of like visually difficult to pick out. So if I were to stare at this data, it would be very hard for me as a human to pick out the fact that there are clear oscillations, but the Fourier transform is pretty good at differentiating. So here's the consequence of that noise is that it's not as clear um, that these are um, not periodic, but these two signals at 10 and 5 hertz still stand out pretty clearly from that visual uh, analysis. So we can do this uh, for more plots. And, and so this, this notebook will be available in Blackboard if you want to play with it, um, just to sort of pick out different analysis with a Fourier transform. All right, so the homework for this week, uh, based on what we've been working on in lecture, is an analysis of some time series data. So it's a pretty straightforward sort of task of taking some data from a website. Uh, and the challenge there is that the website does not allow you to get the data uh, that you want. You have to sort of join multiple data files. And then from that, I'm interested in having a, a bar chart for uh, what the hourly power consumption is on a daily basis. So it's 24 bars in one diagram. The second homework, um, maybe slightly more challenging, is to use uh, a lag plot to identify uh, whether a distribution of values is a time series or just random. And so we'll be using both a lag plot and a histogram, and we'll take some action that if the distribution is in fact uh, time series ordered, then it makes sense to interpolate the data. But if it doesn't matter, then we have to fill in from that distribution the missing values. So this is uh, slightly more complicated. Um, certainly if you have questions, please email me and we can set up a time to talk if needed.